All right. Hey, good morning, my friends. Welcome to the Daily Link, where we take a break from our day so that we, of course, you know the rest, don't take a break from our faith. Uh, happy Tuesday morning to everybody. I hope you did your homework because we had a little bit of homework for you yesterday. Maybe you talked about it with your spouse. Maybe you didn't. Um, but the question that I left you with yesterday, we're, I want to just spend this week diving into that question that the disciples asked Jesus. How do we pray? And more specifically, as you unfold that context, they're not just asking, how do you talk to God? They're talking, how do you move the heart of God? Jesus, what is it about your prayer life? What is it about the prayer life of John that really causes a shift to take place? And um, the question that I left you guys with, with yesterday was, what is the time in your life when prayer meant the most to you? What's one of those times in which this ability to come before your Heavenly Father, it, it just mattered, it ministered to you, and it, and it brought you um, to a place of closeness with the Lord. Perhaps it even yielded the answers you want. But I'm going to go out on a ledge. I'm not going to make you write your answers in necessarily, but I'm going to go out on a ledge. Those of you that did your, did your homework, I'm going to say that one of the things that it shares in common is that it probably came in your life in a season of desperation. It came to you, this beautiful season of prayer came to you when you, you had to lean with everything you had on prayer because you had nothing else to lean on. That's when prayer was most sacred to you. You know, I look at the great prayers of, of Scripture and uh, you guys can acknowledge maybe in the comment section if that's true or not. Just write, that's true, or Brian, you're full of it. Um, that wasn't at all what it was. But, um, you know, I think the great, the great prayers of scriptures, uh, you know, I look at Abraham and how he interceded for a lot when they said the city was going to be destroyed. And he said, for the sake of 100, Lord, for the sake of 90, for the sake of 80, all the way down to 10, there was this burden for a lot in his family and his loved ones that there was a desperation to these to these angels of, of destruction, of judgment. And uh, it moved the heart of God. You know, I, I think about the cries of the Israelites, how they cried out to God in their desperation because he was their only hope. How uh, Eli saw Hannah as she prayed for a son and she says she was mouthing it and she was crying tears, and um, but no words were coming forth. This moment of this place of desperation, it was... You know, David, after his sin with Bathsheba, you can read Psalm 51 and you see the desperation of David to be reunited with his heavenly father. It's the prayer of Jehoshaphat. He's, he's surrounded by three armies and says, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. It's the prayer of Hezekiah as the uh, as Assyria comes down and is laying siege upon the city of Jerusalem and they have no outs. And he comes before the Lord in the, in the temple and he says he spreads out this request before God. You know, it's the prayer of the prophets of Jeremiah, Isaiah, Joel, you know, Jesus in the garden, this place of desperation. I think about the prayer that the disciples must have had in the upper room as Jesus had ascended. And he said, wait till power comes on high. And by the way, it's your job to save the world. You know, I mean, not really, but it's your job. You're my church now. Go forth. And these places of absolute desperation that were met with mighty answers of God. And that's my, that's, that's what it is. That's what it is for me too. And, and I would guarantee that's what it is for you too, is that the times in which prayer has been the most meaningful to us was when we needed it the most. And so is this, is this what God is calling us to, to be this desperate people who, you know, the purpose of God is to make us desperate, to be full of misery and suffering. And if you're not desperate enough, God will, God will not hear you. I don't think that's the case at all. I don't think that's the point. But I think there is something in desperation that connects us to what the point is. Grab your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 8. Um, give you two seconds to find it so I can take two seconds to find it. But I want to I wanna read this for you, maybe in a light that you um, may have not thought about it before. It's a very simple couple of verses here, just start in verse 1. It says, when Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him, and a leper came to him, and it bowed down, and he bowed down before him, 
And he said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing to be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about the significance of Jesus touching the leper. We know how leprosy is spread, and in Jesus' day, there's no secret. They understood how leprosy was spread. They knew it was contagious via touch. And even even aerosol, right? I mean, when, when people had leprosy, not only were they kicked out of the city, oftentimes they would be given a noisemaker. And when people would get too close, they'd have to cover their mouth and yell, unclean, unclean, so that people would would stay away. They knew how leprosy was spread from one person to another. And so they didn't touch lepers because they didn't obviously want to make themselves susceptible to getting sick. And yet, what does Jesus do? Jesus reaches out and he touches the leper. You know, what's riding... When Jesus Jesus, uh, intercedes for this man, if he does it from a distance, if he does it from here to there and says, you know, Lord Jesus, I'm Lord Jesus, but touch this man, what's at stake? Well, what's at stake is that man's life. But when Jesus touches the man, when he makes himself vulnerable and susceptible, when Jesus reaches down and touches him, what's at stake? Now it's not just that man's life. Now it's that man's life and the life of Christ. I I want you to think about the difference between praying for somebody that has COVID, right? And going to a hospital right now in the COVID ward without any PPP and going in and laying hand, going into the rooms and laying hands on people and praying for them that the spirit of God would touch them and heal them. Are you going to have the same prayer here in the comfort of your living room? Oh Lord, be with them and heal them and touch them as you are when you are they're with them, susceptible to the very same thing that they have? Or will it change the way that you pray? See, what Jesus did here is so significant. And I think we give Jesus a pass because, well, Jesus is God. But Jesus is flesh. Jesus is, Jesus is fully man. And, and Jesus, he quite literally, he steps into this man's reality. When he touches the leper, he says, I'm in this with you. And his prayer isn't just for that guy, but the prayer for that guy now becomes with the same desperation that he has for his own life and his own well-being. In other words, Jesus steps into, by simply touching this man, Jesus is stepping into this man's reality. And when he says, I am willing, when he appeals to the Father for his healing, he is not appealing just for that guy. He is appealing as if he is that guy because he now is that guy. Does that I hope this is I hope you're following me. Is that there is a stepping into reality where that the purpose of that desperation is to understand and intercede in the fullness of empathy, not just sympathy but empathy. And when our heart connects to God's heart and what God truly sees and God truly understands, when it begins to move our heart, I believe that is when it really begins to move the heart of God. Jump with me to James. Um, James, the fifth chapter. And I, I did a teaching on this a while back. If I can I explained it once, and if I can explain it twice, then then there's absolutely God. It's, it's a little bit confusing, so tune in with me. Maybe watch it twice. We'll, we'll see if we get through it. <clears throat> this is a very famous verse on, on prayer, uh, but I, I want to jump into it a little bit more and remind us of what it says. So let's start chapter 5, verse 13, and we'll, uh, we'll read through 18. And I want to focus in on one of the verses here. It says, Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He must sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who's sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed any sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. 
pray for one another that you may be healed. This is the verse I want to focus on. It says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. As Elijah was a man with a nature just like ours, he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Again, we're talking about praying, praying through, praying with results, not controlling God, but connecting to the heartbeat of God, prevailing in prayer. Uh, jump back with me to verse 16 uh, B. So the second chapter, second verse, second sentence there. It says, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And if I was to to rewrite this, um, it it would say something more like the effective prayer of a it the where am I at? I totally lost my place. If I can explain this twice, it's good. Um, forget the notes. All right. It says the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. And you have the words effective and accomplish, and they're kind of the same thing. It, it kind of repeats itself here. Um, it, it's almost like it's saying the righteous man's prayers are effective, are effective, and they can accomplish much. But that's not what it's saying. It's saying these effective prayers do accomplish much. Uh, and the word effective, this is important for us to understand. So the word effective here is the word energeo. And I'm sure that's where we get the word energy because it means to put forth power, to be operative. In, in other words, it, it means it's something that works. Not work in a sense where I go to work, but work in a sense of it's it's functional. My car works. My computer works. It does what it's supposed to do. Okay, And so what we can say here is that the prayer that does what it's supposed to do is powerful and can accomplish much. But there's another layer to this word. Okay, So the prayer that does what it's supposed to do, that is working, is powerful and can accomplish much. But this, this, this word also... See if I can do this here. Okay. This word is also a verb that is directed towards, be patient with me, I'll get through it, that is directed toward, it's a verb that's directed towards the one that is doing it. I know you don't follow me, but you will. Okay. So if I am brushing your hair, I know it's a little creepy, right? But if I'm brushing your hair, okay, brush is the verb, brush is the working, okay. Um, but it's directed towards you. I'm brushing your hair versus I'm brushing my hair where it's directed towards me. This, this verb here, this working, this, this effectiveness, what the author is saying, what James is saying is that the prayer that is working on the one who is doing it, the prayer that's working on the one who is doing it is powerful and can accomplish much. You know, I feed my children every day, at least my wife does, and we go to the grocery store and we buy groceries and we bring them down and they eat and they eat and they eat and we provide food for them and they eat very independently of us. We give it to them and they take, they, they, they take the food. That's very different from a pregnant woman, right? But the way that a pregnant woman feeds the child that is within her is she feeds herself. And in feeding herself, that the food that is effective to bring her body nutrients also brings nutrients to the child. This is what the prayer is saying. It, it, this verse is saying is the prayer that is effective in changing the heart, in affecting the heart of the one who prays it. That is the prayer that is powerful and can accomplish much. So when Jesus, when Jesus, when Jesus reached out and he touched the leper, it's very different from us throwing prayers out, right? Because we can say a lot of prayers for a lot of people and a lot of things they, that don't touch reality. They don't change us. They have no effect on us. We go through the motions. We know we should. We saw something on the news. There's something that's making us angry or frustrated. And we throw prayers out there, but they don't ultimately change us. It's so different from when we're actually 
in desperate times, isn't it? Or when Jesus reaches out and touches it, because when Jesus touched that leper, the prayer that he offered changed him. It came from a place that was effective on him because he needed the same result that that man needed in God's ultimate protection and healing over his body. And so the call of intercession for us, the call of prayer to us, these effective prayers that we are called to, and the reason why desperation gets us to that place is because we're actually stepping into a reality where the prayers that we're praying aren't just thrown out there and walked away from, but they're changing and forming our own heart in the process. You know, I was with the men's Bible study this morning. I'll, I'll wrap up here. Um, but, you know, and I, I think I've confessed this to you too. Maybe maybe I haven't, but I'll, you know, it's on the internet now, so whatever. Um, but I, I have struggled in recent months to pray for people that I'm angry with, especially in leadership positions, that I don't feel are doing their job accurate, very well. And I'm not... And so part of the challenge for, for me is that I would pray prayers that would change my heart so that I can pray effectively for their hearts. And uh, I think I'm going to be taking a personal challenge this week. Uh, I would off, I'll, I'll throw it out. I'll throw it out to you too. Uh, you know, our, our city, our city is really hurting. And, you know, we talked several weeks ago about you know, news channels and the things they provide and stuff like that. And whether they're true or not, I'm going to bypass all that. I'm going to bypass all that. Uh, and I want to do a drive through downtown. And uh, one of my friends said they went through and, and couldn't believe it. It was not what they were being told in the mainstream media. And so I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to go and I'm going to drive through. And I want to take it in. I want to take it in because I want to step into reality and I want my heart to be changed so that I can intercede with the desperation that I need to intercede for the lostness of my city right now. And so I'd, I'd offer that same challenge to you. Maybe go by yourself, maybe go with your spouse or with a friend or two and drive through Portland and let the Lord break your heart for what's taking place and not just look at it through the screen or through someone's interpretation of it but go drive through it and see with your own eyes that we would be a people that would intercede and literally touch the leper as our city, as our brothers and sisters that we share this place with. But, um, let me close with you in prayer. I hope this made sense, a little jumbled this morning, um, but the prayers that really change reality are the, are the prayers that really come from the depths of who we are. And think Jesus shows us that in touching the leper. So Lord Jesus, uh, we, we ask that we would be a people of honest prayer, that we would learn to step into the reality of others, that we would see with eyes and hear with ears that are full of, full of your love and your compassion. Help us to see what is true and what is right. Help us to see the world through your eyes and through your love, Lord Jesus. I thank you that Jesus touched the leper and he stepped into that man's reality and the desperation of Jesus' prayer reached your ears. May we be a people who don't just simply throw prayers out that don't affect us, but be willing to step into the suffering, to step into the despair, and to step into the desperation of others' realities that when we pray, Lord, it would not only move your heart, but that it would move our heart as well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Love you guys. We will see you tomorrow.